Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. Despite getting kicked out of more schools than he was let into, our founder guest on today's episode left college early after landing a great job in private equity. After three years and a lot of burnout, he decided to take a break and travel throughout Asia. When he got to his first stop in Mongolia, he wound up deep in the countryside, looking to experience the true nomadic lifestyle. After living with a family of herders for the next month, he started to notice some of the pain points of their lifestyle and launched a nonprofit with initiatives like livestock insurance, water and grassland projects, and veterinary care to help improve and preserve their culture. What he realized was that the economic system the herders were a part of, selling goat fiber used for cashmere to local buyers, was rigged. The buyers would come in, set a super low price, and because they were literally the only buyer in town, get away with it. Our founder realized that the best way to help his nomadic friends and other communities like theirs was to buy up all the raw material himself. And that's how Nottam was born. Today at Nottam, this founder and his team make men's and women's clothes from the best cashmere in the world, straight off the back of goats in Mongolia's Gobi Desert. They cut out all the middlemen from the traditional cashmere trade and work directly with local herders so they can pay them 50% more and charge you 50% less for the softest knitwear on the planet. Their $75, 100% cashmere sweater blew up their business when they launched it in 2018, and today they employ over 100 people. Perhaps the most impressive thing about their business is the commitment to sustainability from day one. They have goals to ensure livable wages across their supply chain, promote ethical conditions for animals that produce their raw materials, and go carbon neutral by reducing emissions and leveraging renewable energy. As a special offer, this founder is giving our listeners 15% off all products on their site. Just use code THEFOUNDER15 at checkout to get the discount. This is an inspiring interview that underlines the importance of building equitable partnerships and a strong value system from day one. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Without further ado, the founder of Nottam, Matt Scanlon. Let's get it. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So what I like to do is before I kind of talk about the origin story and, and hear kind of how you got to where you were, if you could give us a quick snapshot for Nottam, kind of what the company looks like today, what's your mission, vision, the products that you sell, um, just for people who aren't aware. Yeah, um, well, Nottam is certainly a business beyond my wildest expectations. I mean, I, I didn't realize I was, I was getting into this business until I was kind of in it. But we, we've grown a big brand. I mean, we're over 100 people uh, based in New York. and you know, our, I, I believe in for consumer businesses, just nailing kind of a, a product market fit, a kind of core, core product. And a couple of years ago, we introduced our $75, 100% cashmere sweater. And that kind of exploded the business overnight and allowed us to kind of get to where we are now. Uh, but, you know, in its simplest form, we uh, we try and just make soft stuff. And that starts with our, our sustainable cashmere, but we started to expand. And then in the past year and a half, almost two years, we've started to platform our services and build, you know, what we believe will be a more of a hold co for, for multiple brands on a singular backend. So Nottam gave us a good start, but now we're excited about kind of a handful of brands that we'll be, we'll be launching. So I'd love to kind of take a step back and can you walk us through your life and background leading up to, you know, when the, the famous <laughs> Nottam story came to be <laughs> and, and give us that walkthrough? Yeah, yeah. it was, kind of all over the place, man. I mean, I got kicked out of more schools than I got let into, honestly. I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I just uh, wasn't, wasn't much of a student. And uh, much to my parents' chagrin, couldn't couldn't really stay in one place at a time. Over the years, people have asked me, like, oh, why'd you get kicked out of this school and that school? Pretty much for, for everything. I just, uh, I didn't want to be there. Took a tour of boarding schools, took a tour of colleges. I ended up never never graduating college but I spend enough time to get a doctorate. So <laughs> <laughs> I tell people I'm a doctor, but um, I don't have a college degree. You know, the trip that we ended up taking out to Mongolia was very serendipitous. So 
I left school early uh, without getting a degree because I was offered a, a good job. And it was initially in the finance industry and private equity and was given an opportunity to kind of prove myself. And I did over three, little over three years. I didn't love it. I didn't love kind of the work or the industries that we were focused in, but like I understood it at its simplest form, but I got burnt out. I mean, you know, they pushed me pretty hard and kind of came to the realization that if I didn't, if I didn't like love what it was I was doing and I couldn't get passionate about it, then I was never going to be very successful at it. You know, for me, unfortunately, I'm driven by passion. And and I say unfortunately, because it'd be a lot easier to, I don't know, like learn a skill and then just like know how to do something. But I'm only motivated and I and I'm pretty much purely self-motivated by the things that I become passionate in. That first trip we ended up taking out to Mongolia was an accident. You know, I was planning to take time off of work. You know, I had created enough of a cushion that I could go travel and uh, was going to do kind of a tour around Asia, um, had a number of stops. It was a, at least a six month trip. And I hadn't really had the opportunity to do anything like that. You know, everybody talks about going abroad in college and I always wanted to do it. But what they fail to mention is if you're on academic probation, <laughs> conduct probation, they never let you go. <laughs> so I was never I was never allowed to to go anywhere. So I kind of seized the opportunity and said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to travel and was planning to meet up with Diedrich, who's my co-founder at Nottam. He was a student. I mean, he was on his way to earning a Ph.D. in a category of economics called econometrics. And he had some time off. So he said, I'll come meet you while you're traveling. He had done a little bit of traveling in Mongolia. So he said, you know, meet me there and we'll, we'll go kind of bum around and backpack. And it's a pretty cool place. That was kind of the extent of it. Uh, I think, you know, if you look back at everything that's happened since then to now, it's it's kind of like mind boggling that, that we ended up building a business. That trip we took was uh, looking back on it, something I'd probably never, I would never do. Like I was just stupid. And I think for the first kind of three years of building this business, we did it because we just didn't know. Like, like if you told me everything that we were going to go through and all the things we were going to have to do, there's no way I would sign up for that. Like, it's insane, painful, like a total roller coaster. So, it, it, you know, just being naive worked, worked to our benefit. But anyways, we, we, uh, we arrived in Mongolia. We're offered to kind of, uh, get a lift out to the countryside where we were hoping to kind of experience the kind of true nomadic uh, experience of Mongolia something that is very special. And if you're looking to travel for anybody that's looking to travel um, at some point, eventually in the future, the trip to Mongolia is a very unique one. But in any event, these guys took us out and then they they basically left us there. And we were stranded in the middle of the Gobi Desert living with a family of pneumatic herders. Um, we thought, you know, initially we were taking a day trip. They ended up driving, you know, this all day trips, so 20 hours or something all day. And we thought we were doing a big loop, kind of coming back to the city, but it was a straight line out into a really remote area of Mongolia. And they got us there and they said, okay, um, you know, we're, we're going to stay here for a while and you can like hitchhike back or do whatever you want wh whenever. And, you know, I, we were not going to be capable of doing that. Like remote isn't like a good enough word for how stranded we were. This family of nomadic herders who, who we, we were staying with, basically without ever asking and or, or or you know really having a conversation about it, just let us stay. We, we spent better part of a month living with them, and you know there's no electricity, there's no running water. We didn't have any food. We didn't even bring any clothing because we thought we were going on a day trip, and it was um, a really eye-opening experience. And when I tell the story now, obviously I have a little bit of perspective. You know I really was this sheltered kind of privileged kid from Connecticut who hadn't really experienced, you know, different cultures or, or hadn't really been a part of something that wasn't something familiar or comfortable to me. And it was this incredibly eye-opening experience, this recognition that, you know, at our simplest form, all human beings are basically equal, right? That like, there's no difference between, uh, you know, whether you're a nomadic herder in Mongolia or, you know, you work on Wall Street in New York, like at, at base form, all human beings are 
generally experiencing the human condition the same exact way. And it wasn't until I was confronted with that in a very real format that my worldview started to evolve. And, you know, the, the realization for me was that most people don't ever get this experience, right? Most people on planet Earth end up spending most of their life within three to five miles of where they grew up. That's like a fact. So I felt like there was something profound in what I had experienced because it was simple, because it wasn't complicated, because it was about people. It was about this idea that we should do things equitably. We should do things with humility. We should do things with gratitude. And I didn't know, you know, again, this is the naive thing. I didn't know what I was going to do with that, but I just wanted to tell people something that I could get passionate about. I'm sure for, for the listeners or anybody that generally hears this, this is where I kind of feel like an idiot, right? Because like, duh, like, of course, of course, these things matter. Like, of, of course, this is requisite. But you know, I just hadn't had that experience in life. And I wanted to share that with people. So in the course of living with this community and, and this family, we started to identify some of the intricacies of their lifestyle, some of the complications of how extreme their life was. I mean, when I say nomadic, they are truly nomadic. They live in a gear or a yurt and they travel throughout the year. They follow herds of animals. They subsist off of that animal husbandry. And they've been doing that for generations. They are, you know, in tune with nature and their surroundings in a way that, you know, as New Yorkers, we're obviously unfamiliar with. There's something beautiful about that. Having said that, there's also like room for some mitigation, of course, without like dissolving what is valuable about their culture. And, uh, you know, as we've progressed and built our business and kind of solidified the things that matter to us cultural preservation is at the top of the list. You know, we, we fundamentally believe in you know, protecting the thing that we were so enamored with slash like taking care of, but right. Like they took care of us. So we wanted to find a way to preserve that, tell that story, tell our story and connect it to people's experiences around the world. So we left with an idea to actually start a nonprofit and we got involved in nonprofit work doing things that were easy, basically, that we felt we could kind of monitor the impact. So that's livestock insurance, right? Basically saying, hey, we're going to cover your livestock with some insurance. And if anything happens with the crazy weather or, you know, a higher than average mortality rate, you're covered, you'll get new animals. Really simple thing. Investing in water projects or grasslands projects, veterinary care. At the end of the day, these communities the thing that they understand or want to protect more than anything is their livestock. That's their livelihood. So we, we found ways to, again, mitigate some of the extreme variables and provide, you know, hopefully a type of stability that would encourage future generations to want to pick up the same uh, type of livelihood. Because we started to recognize that it was less sustainable than it used to be. And obviously younger generations were feeling less interested in, in pursuing it. So we thought it was important that we kind of invested. So we started building the nonprofit, but failed to do our due diligence. And what would have come up in our diligence was that no amount of nonprofit work would have actually improved their economic circumstances and helped mitigate environmental variables or macroeconomic variables, because the economic systems that they were subjected to were essentially rigged. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this can appreciate that because it happens around the world. It happens right in front of us sometimes. But the systems that they were subjected to were not built in their benefit, unfortunately. And the people that were benefiting were not these communities. People that were making the most money in the supply chains that they were selling product into should have been them because in my mind, they were working the hardest, doing the hardest work but they weren't really getting their fair share of the eventualized value. So what that looked like is uh, trade systems. So if you were a, a goat herder, you would spend your year raising goats. You would then comb the goat and then sell the fiber. Someone would come buy it from you. But if you're in a remote area, it's not like a free open marketplace. The guys that show up and buy it to you say to the guy that's coming with them, hey, let's like rig the price. Let's not overpay this year. Let's pay X. We both know we're going to sell it for three or four times this back in the city. So let's scoop it up and go. And that's what they were doing, which means if I was trying to influence 
their livelihood by investing in programs that create a better material, more sustainable material. No one's going to pay them more money for that. So it was only after kind of coming to this realization, ultimately failing with our kind of first investments, that we recognized the better opportunity was to raise some money and buy the material directly from them. We didn't have a big plan to build a direct consumer brand that went direct to the herders or verticalized the supply chain. We were just doing the next best thing, trying to do the right thing, trying to build equitable trade circumstances, equitable business practices, because we cared, we, we fundamentally cared about the people we were working with. And so as we built and as we kind of ended up building our business into new channels and in new countries, these same principles persist, right? And so what I'm most proud of about what we've done is we've built a business that is still led by the things that guided us on a daily basis, on a micro level when we were first starting, right? Like have humility with your partners, be equitable with all your partners, like try and get a fair deal with everybody. You should win and they should win. Like really simple stuff that like sometimes we forget, right? Sometimes we stop thinking about. So, you know, I don't see it all over the place as much as I would like, but we felt that this was our platform, right? That like a business that was built around the, this value system would ultimately help share our story and get to the root cause of kind of what we experienced. So we started to add all these things up. Now, in the process of adding it up, we had to somehow buy material and know what to do with it. We then had to figure out how to spin material. We had to figure out how to make a product. We had to figure out how to hire people, how to build a business, how to run digital marketing, how to scale digital marketing, how to raise money. I mean, you know, I look back at what I've learned in the past six years since we started, and it's a phenomenal learning curve, like a phenomenal learning curve in an industry that's been on a learning curve anyways. And, and this is probably true for a lot of businesses. We were kind of in the right place at the right time. And again, like I'm, I'm proud of the reasons we did it for and all of that, but like there's a little bit of luck. Actually, I should say there's a shitload of luck. Like at every turn, we've just kind of been in the right place at the right time, right? We were at the right place at the right time where consumer investments were interesting and we could get funded to do the stuff we wanted to do. We're in the right place at the right time in the middle of the Gobi Desert to buy material. We were at the right time and place to scale up a direct consumer business when Facebook and Instagram were cheaper than they were. Like all of these things have really worked out in our benefit. You know, I, I say this to people, but like, I never like went into like a boardroom with like a bunch of business school buddies and wrote up a business plan. Like I never made a business plan. It wasn't until we had to start raising a lot of money that I started to like build a real strategy and business plan. But like until then it was, it was like guided again by those like very simple principles. Someone, I had a mentor early on when I wasn't really sure what I was going to do in my life. And whenever I overcomplicated stuff, he would just say like, keep it simple, stupid. And I, I constantly remind myself of the same saying when you know, we're overcomplicating something in business. It's like, all right, what is this thing actually? And like, how do we not overcomplicate this? Because it's when we start to overcomplicate it that we overthink it. We make it tougher on ourselves. In reality, a simpler message goes a longer way. And it, like an easier to digest product goes a longer way. So, you know, to get back to the story, I guess the, the story that has now, I think, become, I don't, I don't think it's famous but like the people know of when they think of Nautam is to launch the business you know we needed to collect this fiber and these are marketplaces that are not there's no like wire transfers you pay in cash because like your word like they don't know who you are so like here's the money give me the stuff and to have our kind of thesis for the business or this kind of purchase behavior come true we had to buy a, a ton of material. We couldn't come in and be like, hey, we'll take a bushel. Like, no, we need everything or else we don't actually improve those trade circumstances. So, you know, we raised some money from, you know, pr private capital mostly. First, I wired it to a bank in Mongolia. And then I went to that bank, withdrew with the cash. It was about two and a half million dollars. I walked out of the bank with like trash bags filled with money, loaded up the backseat of this Land Cruiser. And then we drove literally 20 something hours off-roading into the middle of the Gobi Desert and we bought 60 tons of cashmere. You know, we, we put it in, I don't know, something like 15 tractor trailers that we had, you know, organized and uh, had it driven back to the capital and we got it back there and we were like, shit, what do we do with it? And we had to learn, we had to figure it out. 
but again, like at every turn, we kind of led with our, our guiding principles. I'd say the biggest principle of all that, um, you know, doesn't hasn't come through yet, but it is obviously critical to the foundation and mission statement of our business. It's like doing things with transparency and sustainability and a, a, a like healthy dose of pragmatism. Like you can't be 100 percent sustainable. And if I go around telling people, hey, like we're the most transparent, the most sustainable. Well, like that's a lot. Like it just is nothing. Nothing in our modern economy is. 100% verifiably sustainable. It just it doesn't work like that. You can't, you just can't. I mean, like maybe there are some things, but you certainly can't do it in peril. And we recognize that. So we, we kind of led with truth, right? Like, hey, we're doing the best we can. The best we can looks like this. Our intention is to do that, but like we're not there yet, nor are like the systems and processes in place for us to even attempt it. So, you know, stick with us and we'll keep you updated and we'll let you know as we do it. Our intention is to make the best, most sustainable version of this thing. At the same time, what we started to recognize was kind of this ancillary value proposition, which is like sustainable peril when we first started was very expensive, right? I mean, like either it was a potato sack or it was like very expensive. You had to pay more for it because it was sustainable, which I thought was bullshit. It just made sustainability not accessible, which made overall sustainability and like improving our environment and our planet something that only rich people or, yeah, like or a like luxury a few, game that's that's crap like that sucks it has to be accessible it has to be something that everybody can do right like tesla is only successful now or or reaching level i mean obviously it's successful but like it's only reaching the levels of success that people have predicted and bet on for years was when they could develop products or 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 cars that were more accessible in their pricing. Like my mom has a Tesla now, right? Like she wasn't going to buy the 160,000 one, but there's one that costs $30,000. Like that's where you start to change what sustainability means, like the perceived value of it. If we can't make sustainability that version of it, in my mind, you're kind of pulling it in the wrong direction. So we started to like reconcile all of these, these different value propositions as we started to build the business wasn't easy you know like i would say we wanted to do things before we were capable of doing them and you know there was a good deal of like manifesting and like just like saying it it would come true until it came true the biggest learning lesson for me in building the business has probably been that like there's really no replacement for time <laughs> like like you can't make things go faster and in apparel, like it just takes time to build a brand. I mean, like any consumer, I should say, like consumer takes time Like to have a brand that's meaningful for people. You don't do it overnight or else it's not really meaningful for people. You have to like give it time to saturate a little bit and marinate, I should say. And I think we've given it time and we're really proud of that journey and, and what the brand looks like today. I'm, you know, people talk to me about the business and sometimes I like think they're talking about another brand, you know, because for me, it's still like an idea. You know, that's kind of how we got here, man. Yeah, it's a crazy story. I'm curious, once you shifted from, you know, the mentality of like, all right, let's buy all the raw material, figure out what to do with it and, and kind of flip the switch in your mind to, all right, we're going to have to start making apparel and selling it. What was the early like customer acquisition, like marketing that worked, the profile you were going after? What, what did that look like initially? And how's that evolved over time? Yeah. For our business to be successful, we had to kind of stack everything up, right? You had to have our brand needed to be designed aesthetically and from a mission perspective for a demographic. I guess the simplest way to say this is like, we had to stack our product market fit. So the brand had to be designed for a specific group of people. The product had to then be designed for, for those people. It then had to be priced for those people. The objective, however, was to tap into the audience that was the biggest and was going to end up using the platforms we knew we could get the most scale out of. So it, it's a simple equation when, when you think of it like that, that okay, uh, our audience is a millennial, just generally speaking, they are. Their values are sustainability, transparency, a, a price value scenario. Okay. They want luxury and want to be able to afford it, right? They've been brought up like expecting luxury so that they want to be able to afford it. Now let's go target them. 
and once you kind of like do all the hard work, and that's a lot of hard work, right? You have to like properly identify your brand value. You need to be able to articulate it. They need to be able to show it. You need to do that all at cost efficiently. You have to build your website. Then you have to do all the hard work of building your supply chain to make that product. But then you have to have the cash in the place and time to have enough of that inventory to then sell it to that well-positioned product market fit scenario. And then you have to have the money to buy the advertising. It's like- It's a tough equation when you actually do it. This is not easy. Like, like I get that like, I make it simple for myself, right? I, cause I have to, but at the end of the day, like the amount of systems and processes you need to put in place to make all of this work is really hard, really, really hard. And we were only able to do it by like chipping away at it and slowly kind of like prove, proving ourselves out. But once it all added up, right? Once we had the product at the right price and we knew who the demographic was, it was easy. And that's, that's really been a success so far. For people who don't know, like when you think about cashmere versus other materials, and, and I know something you've, the brand stands for heavily is we make soft stuff. Frame that for people who don't understand like how much softer and better and like a better experience it is to wear cashmere versus some of these other materials. It's, it's so funny. This is kind of a tangent, but uh, I think it, it'll help make the point. Nautam has a sub line that we sell just to QVC. Not a lot of people know this. We have our e-commerce business. We have a wholesale business. We have a big QVC business. And I go on QVC <laughs> on air selling women's sweaters, which, okay, that's like a whole nother thing. But what I've learned in the process is to try and explain <laughs> to people what cashmere feels like without them being able to touch it, right? Like through, through the TV. Fundamentally, however, it, it's a luxury. It's a luxury material and it has been for literally centuries hundreds of years this is what royalty french royalty wore cashmere in the 1600s brought over from asia but it was a true luxury product and generally speaking it's been limited in its inventory cashmere is a small industry it's maybe 10 billion dollars worldwide it's, it's small but that's why it's a slightly higher priced product and obviously all the like different trade systems have inflated the price having said that its fiber is super thin so what comes off of the animal is this really, really thin fiber that creates that super soft hand feel. It's a very thin fiber because the animals, the goats that it come off of, live in these crazy harsh conditions. So we're talking about the steppe of Asia, which is, you know, this is some of the coldest climate on planet Earth, like Siberian cold climate, negative 40 degrees on average. And so these animals have over centuries had to adapt to the climate um, and they build these really thin fibered undercoats underneath their overcoat. And that's what cashmere is. It's the undercoat of a goat. It comes from their stomach and their neck area. It can get off the back a little bit, but it is rare and absolutely luxurious. I've never seen anything in the synthetic marketplace that can recreate it because it is so fine. Cashmere is what we qualify as micron. It stays between like 12 and technically 19 microns, but like the best stuff's at like 15. That is literally a thousand times thinner than what's on your head. So like, think of that. That, that, that's what gets woven together. And you have to like weave it into yarn and really tighten it. Um, and then you wash it. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole process. But if I had known all of that, like if I had known how complicated the process was of taking the raw material and turning it into the fine, luxurious yarns and then knitwear, Again, it would be something I probably wouldn't have invested in because it's an incredibly difficult thing to master. And you notice the businesses that do it really, really well, they start to separate themselves from other businesses because they're literally mastering a craft. You think of Laura Piana, Brunello Cuccinelli, um, they're mastering a craft. And that's ultimately what Nottam's had to do over the years. We've had to, from its very root, learn to master making, making product out of this fiber. I'm curious about the distribution strategy. So I feel like you're, you guys are unique in that you have the e-com, you have some brick and mortar, but you also have the wholesale business. Like you said, the QVC, you know, when you were building the brand, was that a thought initially? Like let's diversify, essentially diversify risk, right? By having multiple streams. And, and the second piece is given coronavirus and everything with how like people are weary to go brick and mortar, how do you think that strategy is going to evolve going forward, brick and mortar versus digital? So yeah, our strategy all along was to be profitable. We wanted to build a profitable business and we knew that an omni-channel approach would even out our gross margins and help us build a profitable business. 
Plus, it would utilize systems cross-functionally across multiple distribution strategies would then make the cost-benefit of investing in those systems more palatable. So the scenario of being omnichannel is, is a lot better if you want to build a profitable business. I think it's 100% what you should do. It's what you, you've always should have done. There was this time where it was like, just go direct consumer. First of all, I don't think that that's ever going to be or ever was the right equation for apparel for so many reasons. Just like fundamentally apparel something you at some point have to touch and feel and try on. So like to not build in a either retail or wholesale model, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because that's how the majority of consumers in the United States purchase product, right? Like direct consumer is awesome and it is absolutely part of our future, but I don't think it ever exists without the in-person piece, just by the nature of the product itself. So we reconciled all of that to build a distribution strategy that was going to be more diversified. I mean, what we wanted was something more diversified because we thought that that would be a less risky financial bet. And it turned out to be much more beneficial. I mean, I remember going into VC offices and like, oh, you do wholesale? We didn't realize. Like, we're really just investing in e-commerce. And I'd be like, no, no, no. Like, look at my financials. Like, look at how well this business operates. When I have two or three channels working together, it makes the cost of hiring all these people to run systems and operations and supply chain and fulfillment a lot more leverageable. Just wasn't the right time for that. I mean, eventually we, we did acquire the funding, not to raise a, a good deal of money at this point, more than I would have liked. But Omnichannel is, and, and you look at like the biggest apparel brands in the world, they're all Omnichannel, right? They do, you have to do, to build a billion dollars in sales, you literally have to do everything. You have to do off price, you have to do retail, you have to do e-com, you have to do wholesale for the most part. That's the equation. It's very difficult to do it without that. So we recognize all of that. We built that, that kind of diversification absolutely on purpose and it's benefited us. It benefited us, I think, in a very extreme way during kind of the coronavirus stuff because sure, like, yeah, maybe there was some trepidation around what wholesale would do, but ultimately you know, we had three other channels that were clicking away that we felt confident about. Sure, we had to pause some of our retail, but we have our private label clients. We still have wholesale, you know, working for us. Um, but e-com took off again in, in a season where it's normally less busy for us. So that levered approach has made our business uh, virtually untouched by COVID. I mean, pretty much no impact to our business. I mean, while other people are furloughing, we've been hiring. I think we, we, we've hired 25% more people since all of this started because you know we, we didn't see any financial impact to our business now there's some ambiguity going into fall because there's ambiguity for everyone on planet earth right now except for hand sanitizer makers but like uh for the most part you know we, we feel like the ambiguity is manageable and we, we don't see a world in which you know our product our core product doesn't end up selling when it's cold outside like it does doesn't matter like it's well priced it's it was built for people who were more mindful around their wallet anyways. I want to shift gears a little bit. I know, you know, another hat you wear is investor, right? And you invest in a lot of these companies. And I'm fascinated by kind of the thesis and, and ways people who are currently founding and running a company think about these types of investments. So can you talk through kind of what's your thesis? What do you look for in some of these companies that you've invested in? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same things that we, you know, built Model Musing. It was like, I want to find product market fit. And product market fit is like, you know, when you see it, it's not, if you're not sure if it's there, I can tell you for a fact, it's, it's not, not there. there. Yeah. Right. Because like, if you made something that people wanted, they bought it. It didn't matter if you spent money to do it or you had all your systems right. They started buying it. And maybe you didn't know what you're doing and the systems fell apart, but that's different, right? That's something in my mind is manageable. A good founder can overcome. A smart team can manage. Product market fit either takes a really long time to figure out and a lot of money to figure out. And we've seen a lot of these consumer businesses have to deal with that or it's natural and it's totally organic to the business. So fundamentally, that's what I'm looking for. Branding, right? Like I think the branding is critical, right? You want to see a brand talking to their customer. And if they're not, then they don't have their, their brand fit either, right? Like you want them to be able to know who their audience is. I mean, that's part, that's like an extension of product market fit ultimately. So you know, financial health, you know, I'm looking for business owners who know how to 
manage the, the financial cash flow of a sophisticated business. And not everybody does. And you kind of know it when you see it. You know when you have founders that like don't have financial discipline because I've been through it. Like I, I can identify when you overspend on something when you just didn't know it, it should cost. And if you're not like cutting down that learning curve fast enough, you're going to overspend and the money that you're raising isn't going to be put in the right place. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult balance on an ongoing basis, being able to say, I mean, like it still is a challenge for me. How much should this thing cost? How much are we going to spend on it? Do I need to haggle? Am I negotiating or am I going to pass on this expense? And so founders who kind of know how to manage that at the startup level, that's really, really critical. That's like super, super important. And I, you know, I guess what all of this comes down to at the end of the day, is who are the founders? Like, what does the team look like? Some founders know what they're doing or can learn, right? Have the intangibles. It's like evaluating an athlete or something, right? There's like intangibles behind like the athleticism. And for me, for a fa- for a great founder, things like self-awareness is really critical. Like really being able to understand the things you don't know. Hiring, being able to hire great teams. I, in fact, don't really know much, right? Like, I, and I'm not, and I'm not good at a lot of things. But I know how to hire people. And I've always, my entire life, had to rely on other people for me to do things, right? Like if it was school, like I wasn't going to get a good grade. So I had to figure out how to position myself with the person who could get a good grade so I could sit next to them. You know what I mean? Like during a test. Like So those are the things that um, I'm constantly evaluating. And I'd say um, evaluating that kind of stuff is easier at the seed stage. It's overall a risky bet, right? Like evaluating C stage businesses is overall a very risky thing. But the things that you're evaluating, I understand, right? Like I've done the startup thing for so long that I feel like I I can see it. Like I, I know it when I see it. I know when they've identified something that maybe I wouldn't have identified on my own. So yeah, that, that's like basically how we go about it. It's been an interesting past few months kind of looking at this investment climate. You know, not a lot of people are putting money down right now. And I think, you know, potentially there's a reason for that outside of COVID also. I think that maybe that should have happened regardless. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think good businesses and great ideas are still going to rise to the top. But th- there's not going to be a replacement for that. And I think I think what people kind of got wrong at the height of consumer investing was like, this was easy. And if you threw enough money at it, it would work. I think that that's just fundamentally wrong. It, it doesn't work like that. It, you can't just buy a good business from scratch. You're counting on a bunch of stuff that is totally intangible in my mind. And when, when you think back, the ones you hit, you obviously got everything right. But more importantly, the ones you missed on, do you think that was a lot due to like a misread on the founders? Like think back to, I don't, I don't know how many you feel like you've missed on, but what do you think underlying was the cause? Well, the biggest thing for me is, is the investments that I missed, right? Like the ones that were really good that like I didn't see. That's more challenging than the ones you invest in that end up not working. I, I don't second guess that stuff because the factors that predict, you know, whether or not something was going to be successful or not are just out of my control past a certain point. The thing that re- really gets me is like when I passed on it, like I didn't want to invest in it and it ended and up it being successful. Yeah. What are, what are some of those that come to mind? Any, any off the top? Well, they, they happen for different reasons. I would say some of them happen because I, negotiated poorly, right? Like I was too tough and the business, I thought the value was too high or something. And then I was proven wrong, like immediately when the business scale and I was like, oh, like I'm such an idiot. There was one, I think it was called Misfit Produce, the produce business. And I, I, this was like one of the first investments we saw. They go around to the farms, they buy the produce that is bruised or ugly and they buy it all at low cost. They build a supply chain for it. And then they package it up and ship it directly to people. And it blew up. Like they were like, there was an, I think the valuation was like 25 million. I was like, Ooh, that's like past where we like to play. And you know, within six months they were like at a hundred million in revenue or something. And I was like, what the hell? Like I'm such an idiot. How did I miss that? I don't know. I, I have to do more thinking around like the actual investments that I feel like I, I missed other than that. But that one sticks with me for sure. I probably would have invested more in my own business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Out of the fund. But again, there, there are other reasons that we, we didn't end up doing that. A lot of it's probably like capital at a certain time, right? At a point in time, like risk profile, all of it. Yeah, there's there's a good deal of that. But at the same time, it was like politics as well. Like it's not a good look to overinvest. But I, I'd say 
the investing side has been critical. And I think a lot of early stage founders end up doing it because you learn a lot, right? Like one, you get to see a lot of other really good founders. I learn stuff from the investments we make. One of my favorite investments we made is Buffy, which is the, the betting brand. And what I always believed in was the founding team and their ability to scale, to overcome obstacles, their vision for their brand, how meaningful that brand would be to customers. And by and large, we were right with it. I think, I think all of that has come true. And they've dealt with obstacles. They've overcome those things. They've scaled a really beautiful business. For me, that business really fits with kind of my thesis for why I invested in the first place. The other thing I wanted to touch on, so you're wearing a ton of hats, right? You're also like acting CEO of something, Navy and Tacoon, because you don't see that very often, right? People are running their own business, investing a ton, and then, and then also kind of CEOs of other businesses. When you thought about like adding those to your plate, what made that compelling and kind of how, you know, how does that work for you? So it's, it's actually not very complicated. I think people look at it and go, well, how could you do that? The success that I've experienced in my career has largely been due to the fact that like, I clearly recognize that there's a lot of things I'm not good at. And the cost benefit of me investing my time and trying to learn those things or just trying to do them in the first place is a waste of time. It's a waste of my time and it's a waste of the team's time. And so I've really prioritized only getting good at a couple of things. Like I, I don't do everything and I don't need to make decisions on everything either. I don't need to know why the crib looks like this or the product looks like that. We have a great design. I trust the design team, right? We have a merchandising team. I trust the product. You know, that's kind of the way we scale the business. I don't need to do everything. I don't need to make decisions on everything. I don't micromanage. I trust the people I hire. And listen, if they make a mistake and it fails or they're not good at it, it ends up not working out, then fine. But my skill set is finding the right person. So I focus on that. And that skill set is transferable across every brand, Right. And then, of course, like my experience can step in at these early stage things, right? And I can say, okay, well, I've seen this exact scenario and I know that it looks different or it needs to look like this or the team should work like that or communication should feel like that. So it, it's actually not as complicated as people think. And I, I, I don't do as much as probably people want me to, right? Like people see it like, wow, like you're probably doing everything for everyone all the time. You don't sleep. And I'm like, no, I sleep fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't worry about it. It, it hasn't been as hasn't been a big challenge. I'd say the only time that it has really become challenging has been during the COVID stuff. And that was largely due to the fact that like, there were a lot of people that were looking, I felt anyways, that were looking to me to have answers that like I didn't have. Right. And I ultimately just felt bad. Like there were so many macro changes and ups and downs. And it was like navigating more than a hundred people through something that like everyone was blinded. And I'd say it's easy to to do my job across multiple brands when things are good. It's hard to to do it when things are like the way they were during like a black swan event. Obviously, it's very very difficult. But I think we've managed well, and you know, I'm proud of the team. I'm proud of where the businesses are. I mean, like I said, virtually unchanged. I mean, n- no no major impact to our businesses so far. Given kind of the core competencies that you've identified, one question I'd love to get your take on is is around hiring. So something I've said on this show almost every episode, I think hiring is the most important thing you can do. And and it sounds like you (laughs) echo that as well. Like if if you find superstars and they, you know, they run the business for you or, you know, run aspects of the business, it becomes a lot easier for you. So I'm curious when you, when you look to hire, you know, executive level or below, what are some of the consistent qualities that you find across those superstars? Uh, strong communication skills, fundamentally, right? Like you have to be able to explain to people what's happening, why it's happening. You have to like overanalyze that communication. I would say empathy is really critical or like an interest in developing yourself and, and you develop yourself by like understanding other people, right? So it's that communication meets empathy that I think is really critical and self-awareness. I, that's what I look for, right? Like if you have those skills, then you can learn the technical side of something, right? Like a you know, great example, we, we have a, an executive, she's on, on the marketing side of our business, and she's genuinely interested in developing her skills on empathy and self-awareness, but she is naturally all of those things, right? And she's constantly evolving it. She didn't have a lot of marketing technical skills, but that didn't matter, right? Because she had all the other pieces that made learning that really easy, that made her ability to say, okay, I found a great person to teach me who I'm going to hire. For me, people I hire, no matter where, you know, where they are in the organization, whether they're directors or executives or whatever, I need to learn from them. Like they're there to teach me something, whether it is one of those intangible skills or one of those technical skills, 
But I, that's always what I'm looking for. And I think that's what will make a good employee up to a good, good executive. If you don't have those things, you can't really replace them. If you don't have that like natural gift, you know, it, it's just going to create a lot of difficulty, in my opinion. It creates bottlenecks in the organization, right? Like think about the way communication works. It's all about how you, how you motivate people, how you talk to people. If, you know, you're dealing with somebody, and I'd say this is, this is maybe the biggest one. If you're dealing with somebody who has like a lot of ego and doesn't, doesn't like easily recognize it, like I don't know how to do this thing. I don't need to be right. Like I rarely need to be right. I don't care about being right. As long as the company reaches the right conclusion or right decision, I don't care if it's me that came up with the idea or somebody else. But if you have people in an organization that you're trying to run that way, that care only about being right and only care about their own ego, then that becomes a big problem. And I try and avoid that at all costs. I think it can destroy an organization pretty quickly. A couple questions here around, you've mentioned you've, you've gone through some rounds for Nottam, you're an investor as well. So I, I'd love you to put on your I'm raising money hat and your funder hat, investor hat. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from investor pitches? Either they went well or you got burned on. <laughs> it's a numbers game. You just have to be at the right place again, kind of at the right time with the right investor. I have met with literally every investor and consumer at some point or at one point or another, I've met with them and I've been told no more times than I've been told. Yes, obviously. I mean, I've been told no by pretty much everybody, but it was like being at the right place at the right time for that investor that made it work. I can't control that, right? Like I can't know that this firm is interested in investing in this type of business at this time. But you just have to have like an unbelievable level of resilience and you can't be affected by no's because it's going to happen. Like if if every time someone said no to me, I was like totally crushed and didn't feel like I could recover from it. We would have never gotten anywhere with the business. I had to be told no. For me, like every time I was told no, it was leading to a yes. And I still I still view it that way. It's a numbers game. You just got to go talk to as many people as possible. And you have to be willing to walk into every meeting and kind of bring the passion no matter what. Right. Like you can't have a flat investor pitch. And listen, if you don't believe in your business and you don't believe in your product, it'll show up because eventually you're going to get tired. But like for the founder who believes in what they're doing and is motivated beyond external circumstances, but driven by something that's inside of them, doesn't matter. Right. Like there, there's no way they're going to be dissuaded. You've already mentioned this a little bit, but if if you were to manifest the next five to seven years for Nottam, and I know you referenced, you know, kind of coming up with almost like a portfolio platform approach, rolling other brands into it, paint that picture if you were manifesting it. I would like to have seven to ten brands, but I want them to be like the best brands, right? Like Nottam wasn't always like, in my opinion, one of the best brands. It took time to get there. It took time for us to like build our identity. You know, my hope is that we build multiple brands that are all scaling up to a hundred million. I'd love to have like seven to 10 brands all scaling up to a hundred million that have like a unique and core identity that separates them, that has that product market fit. And I want them all to be unified by a centralized back system of systems like customer service, merchandising, financial operations, sales operations, supply chain fulfillment. That's our, that's our version of this thing. And, and it's not that unique. This has existed when you think of like the major consumer, uh, like apparel conglomerates, you have Tapestry, you have G3, you have L Brands. It works in our industry really, really well. So, you know, the idea is to build kind of the next generation of it. And we feel like we're capable of doing it because we feel like we've learned some stuff that other people haven't learned. When we look around and we see all these businesses that got funded to build direct consumer brands and what we're realizing is the value is in diversification of those distribution channels and they don't have the money or capability or experience to build the operations to scale past where they are. And they spent most of that money on branding or marketing or whatever. And we have it all. That's what we focused on. That's what we focused on building was back office finance report more thoroughly so that we could enhance the business analytics uh, or product design or whatever it is on an ongoing basis. We focus on that supply chain fulfillment systems to build cost efficient tools that then could be leveraged. You know, we feel like we have all of that more than potentially a lot of our contemporaries do. And listen, there's a couple, there's a couple others out there. Like Connor Thursday has done, in my mind, close to the same thing. And you know, someone we trade notes all the time, but I don't think there are a lot that are well equipped to do what we're trying to do next, honestly. I agree with all that kind of systematized back office piece that gets ignored often. People pay all that, spend all their money on customer acquisition and all that, and then they're left kind of holding the bag. 
a couple more questions for you and then then I'll get you out of here. I know the, the puppy's getting restless. <laughs> so I know you you're getting exposed to a lot either in apparel or outside as a consumer investor or like a, you know, founder trying to trying to start something. What are a couple of emerging trends that really excite you right now? It's a good question. You know, I think finally sustainability is emerging as not like a fringe trend, but like something that you can actually build real real value off of, right? Like obviously that's been kind of core for me for a long time. I don't know. I have to think about that. I, you know, I probably had a better thesis for this, but COVID kind of flipped it on, on its head, right? Because so many consumer products are now becoming more valuable than they were obviously before all of this, right? Like, like the consumer economy is totally different now than it was six months ago. I mean, that's why investing right now is so difficult because, you know, we don't know what industry is going to have the least resistance scaling over the next, let's call it like six to 18 months trying to determine that is just as difficult, right? Like you could invest in businesses that have, you know, that, that make, you know, the right sort of uh, hand sanitizer, but like six months might go by and they might find out that gives you cancer or something. Like who the hell knows? So trends are difficult and I kind of rely on the things I know. That's fair. In terms of, you know, if, if people, people hear this and they're either interested in brand building, company building, the, the, your story, apparel, what are there any like books, newsletters, podcasts, YouTube video channels, any any of that that you'd recommend for people to check out? I read The Morning Brew all the time. I read Lean Lux all the time, which is uh, like a consumer modern retail newsletter. Those two I, I read regularly, but like I'm a sucker for the New York Times and like the big guys. Like I like I'm looking at you know the biggest news channels and then things that are like micro on my industries. But other than that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much focused on what we're doing. Gotcha. All right. Final two questions. We ask these to every guest. You know, a lot of this is piecemeal through your, all your answers, but uh, we go through as a startup manifesto. So if you, if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? So I'd say one, having humility in the things you don't know is critical. I'd say being grateful for both opportunities and mistakes, which I, I think we spoke a lot about treating everyone equitably, right? Like there's no replacement for doing the right thing. And then two things that I think are critical. You have to fundamentally work harder than everybody else to do this. And you have to have, in my, in my experience, a really healthy fear of failure. I just never wanted to fail. And, and, and you know, for me, that's guided me for a long time. That's great. And then last one is the, is the nomination. So Connor nominated you. That's how we got connected. This has been a really successful way for our, our show to grow. So it's your turn to nominate another founder that's either a friend, colleague, or a mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show in the future. I would nominate Leo from Buffy, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have to get him on. So before we wrap, I just want to quickly acknowledge you. I, th- I think in hearing this conversation and chatting with you, I think you're, you know, you've mentioned a few times, but your self-awareness is is off the charts. And I think that it can't be overstated how important that is. So it's it's really inspiring to to see that and, and to chat with you. And I, I'm really looking forward to kind of staying connected and supporting not them and all the brands you've got um, moving forward. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, this has been fun. You want to plug the website and social for, for not them and your personal handles if you want people to check you out? Yeah, totally. Not co is our website and at not co is our Instagram. Awesome. Matt Scanlon, founder of not Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to that episode with Matt Scanlon of not Remember, if you want to support the show, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts. After you subscribe, please leave us a five-star rating and a couple sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. This might not seem like a lot, but these ratings and reviews are super important and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Two, follow us on social media, mainly Instagram, at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up discount codes from all of our founders' companies as well as the books and resources that they recommend. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway and this is The Founder.